So um, I want to begin by uh, gratefully and really respectfully acknowledging that I work and I, I live and we're gathered here on the traditional unceded Algonquin territory. And I also want to acknowledge um, that the history of colonialism that is really present in the context of what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to describe myself visually for access reasons. I have rather unruly curly brown uh, graying hair and wearing black shoes, uh, black jeans, black jacket, and a white t-shirt with a cat on it. And I want to shout out to Mike H from being studio for the design. Um, I'm also going to commit to visually describing the slides on the screen, uh, both images and any text that appears that isn't spoken into our talk. Um, so what is being? Being is an art studio, a not-for-profit art space uh, in the Bronson Center here in Ottawa. Uh, we support uh, the practice of, of 53 uh, artists with disabilities. The organization has been around since uh, 2002, incorporated as a registered charity since uh, 2005. Um, it used to be called Heart of Ottawa uh, until it became being in 2016. I'm here as an ally. I am a white, non-disabled, non cisgender person, and that's really important for me to say, not only to acknowledge the enormous social privilege that I receive because of those things, but also because the disability justice and the disability arts movements in Canada and abroad uh, really center cultural and political self-determination. So that means as disability artists, disability curators, uh, thinkers, organizers, activists who are leading that move, those movements and doing the work uh, which I see myself as a partner in supporting and promoting. It's also important for me to mention my position as an ally because we share a very difficult history uh, of institutionalization of people with disabilities. It's a very recent history, and uh, in, in terms of intellectual disability in Ontario in particular, uh, people were very commonly, and until very recently, um, housed in large institutional spaces, and these were not kind spaces, to say the least. And the largest and most notorious of these closed down as recently as 2009 in Aurelia, Ontario. And I don't want to make it seem that institutionalization is a thing of the past. It is still very much, uh, and, and its, it's uh, institutionalization and its legacy are still very much present today. And they're rooted in something you can think about as the medical model of disability. So on the slide right now, it says medical versus social model of disability. There are two lists, uh, the medical model and the social model. So under medical model, uh, you'll recognize this is a very clinical way of looking at disability. It often uh, focuses on the type and severity of someone's disability. Uh, it, it locates disability as in the person, as like a health concern, something too uh, that it's bad that you need to mitigate or cure or therapize. It frames difference in relation to a normal, uh, quote unquote, uh, healthy standard. Uh, and it leads to narratives where the individual is often victimized, their disability is something that they need to overcome. Uh, within the scope of being a studio, it's often the medical model of thinking that will lead people to assumptions that what is going on in, our, in the studio space is therapy. The social model, on the other hand, locates the barriers in the, fit, in, uh, in the environment. So it says that what disables someone isn't their impairments, it's the physical barriers in the space, it's the way society is organized, it's the behaviors, it's the discrimination in the language that set the conditions for poverty and uh, discrimination. So impairments are not what disables people, the way society is organized to disables people. So I think I was supposed to talk about silence. <laughs> So I think there's a good silence and there's bad silence. There's the good silence that makes space for contemplation. It's the removal of noise and the absence of sound. Yay. Uh, there's also bad silence, if you think of silence taken as an act. So uh, silencing a witness or silencing dissent, silencing a survivor. 
And there's also a silence that happens when someone isn't part of a conversation, or someone isn't part of a space, when their opinions aren't spoken into a boardroom, or their desires and their struggles and their stories aren't a part of an art collection. And that is the kind of silence that an idea like inclusion is trying to address. And now we're going to illustrate inclusion. So, uh, just a little interactive moment. I'd like each and every one of you in this space, in this auditorium, to just kind of look around you in whatever range of motion is available to you. And take note of who's here. You're all looking at me still. Look around. <laughs> so who is here? Who isn't here? And why do you think that is? And think of all of the steps that it took for you to get here this morning. Not, you know, just noticing the event, being invited to it, the steps that it took for you to uh, accept the invitation, confirm your presence. But go beyond that. All of the experiences that have led you to be here this morning. The career path that you're on. The educational opportunities that you received. Okay, The barriers that you may or may not have faced. So, now I want you to look around again and notice who is it here. And I'm bringing this up because it's not enough to think about inclusion and to talk about inclusion. We need to also talk about power. I'm quoting, uh, sharing a quote here by Eliza Chandler, who's a disability art curator, thinker, and organizer. And the quote reads, when we're including ourselves into something, we need to be asking, what are we being included into? Are we being included into a colonial nation, colonial practices, racist practices, or are we actually undoing these things in processes of reconciliation? So there's a lot going on in this quote. But the main takeaway thing to focus on is that it's not enough to talk about including people. People need access to power, resources, money. It's about transforming the spaces that you are including people into to disrupt the imbalances of power that lead to the conditions of poverty and discrimination in the first place. So at Bean Studio, what that looks like is not just creating an inclusive art space, but it's about committing to transforming the way we are governed and the way we think about our operational leadership to make being into a more collectively held space to ensure that we're centering disability leadership. And on that note, I would like you to join me in welcoming Debbie Ratcliffe. Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm here to represent my fellow artists. You don't like I hate silence. <laughs> silence drives me bonkers. It has no voice, no meaning to me. I rather have noise because I sleep better with noise. And how long have you been an artist, Betty? I've been an artist for 13 years and enjoying every minute of it. Sure. I have two butterflies, as you can see. One is red and one is yellow. I have two dragons, a female and a male dragon. I have a turtle on top of a hill that's looking, that's dancing everywhere. I have myself there looking in and watching seeing what's going on. They don't know I'm there. I see an egg in the, in, in the cave, and then they notice me. They ask me to take care of their eggs for them while they go and hunt for food. And um, so this is actually not a recent work of yours, because it was sort of a seminal piece uh, 
It's been a long, it, I've had this piece for a very long time. And why are you so interested in dragons? Dragons are whimsical. They're very whimsical. I read about them all the time. They're powerful. They make noise. They make things happen. And uh, can you talk a, about, a little bit about the egg? You were talking about what that represents. The egg represents life, a new beginning. It's their dynasty. It's a new beginning every generation of eggs. Okay, here's another work on the screen. The text reads, Debbie Ratcliffe, The Spirit Tree, 20 by 24, a ghost paint on canvas. This one has a lot of meaning to me as well. Um, you can see butterflies, you can see birds, you can see a turtle, a unicorn, and a duck in a corner. That duck is very lonely. It's lost its family and it's searching for a new place to live. So all the other creatures have asked it to live with them and he's thinking about it. <laughs> so, and the tree of life, as you can see, is a new beginning for all the creatures of the world including people. And the other day you said that your, um, your art is loud. What do you mean by that? It's bold. It has a voice of its own. It has a mouth of its own. It speaks volumes to people. It's, it's like saying, I'm here. Okay, and we have uh, some other work that we picked from Being Studio that we'll take a look at. So uh, this is a work by Alana Price. So it's being a little blown out by the screen, but um, it, the text on the screen is Alana Price, Coffee Break, Acrylic on Canvas. And in this one, Alana loves to um, do her own work and she puts all of her texts on top of each other. So it's sort of like um, you can't, some of it's legible, but other, others it's not legible. Elena is very um, interested in text. Very much. And, uh, and, and like her process is to really coat uh, you know, all of the paper, the canvas, right. and the text, and that's, that's how she's recording moments in time. Um, so visual description, we've got a square uh, yellow background on the canvas and then some uh, layered fine mark. Some of it is legible to me, some is not. Um, uh, like layered text in pinks and whites and greens and blues. Right. Next we have a work by Jake Riseborough. The text on the screen says, Jake Riseborough, cute baby battles whiny baby. He dodges the poo gray, then gets hit. <laughs> Whitney, uh, whiny baby's weakness, enters the picture. Diaper rash, inkjet print, and colored pencil on paper. <laughs> Quick visual description. Uh, there is a photographic image of Jake in the center of the composition. Some drawn marks around and on top of his image. He's wearing a cape, a bib, and a diaper. And all the colors, like he's got yellows, greens, purples, oranges, and he's got two babies, one, one on either side of them. And so Jake is really invested in his persona of the super baby, uh, which is both very vulnerable and very powerful. And he has a, a series, I believe, called the Adult, Adult, Baby series, uh, Adult Babies Go to Work series. Um, and so these narratives of the super babies often play out in his work. And the next piece on the screen is uh, text reads, Annalisa Kiss Kiss, Florida Beach, 14 by 18, acrylic on canvas. Does someone in the audience want to get, take a stab at this dragon now? Uh, so it's an abstract composition with some representational elements. You have um, like 
six layers of colors. At the bottom, you have uh, horizontal stripes in red, orange, blue. At the top, you have wave-like uh, lines. Uh, there's a large light blue line then, uh, with waves at the top, and then dark blue with waves, and then orange with waves. Very thank you. <laughs> uh, and Debbie Annalisa is, is one of your colleagues and good friends. So yeah, uh, she's one of my best friends. And I really respect her work as well as she res respects ours. Like where I work, we're all family and colleagues. Has she shared much with you about what, what she's interested in and, and what she's interested yeah, in? Yeah. Her dreams are to leave Ottawa and go to Paris, France, to learn more about her, about her work, about doing her work. And we have another work by Annalisa. Text on the screen is Annalisa Kiss Kiss, Mandela 16 by 16, acrylic on canvas. And visual description is a black square field, some circular uh, shapes concentric rings. One of the rings notably says ASL, ASL, ASL over and over. And uh, there are a lot of other shapes and patterns and some bright colors in the center. Yes. And um, my friend is hard of hearing. So she uses a lot of sign language. And I'm learning it from her. Uh, which is what ASL it's American Sign Language. Um, I wonder what Annalisa's relationship to silence might be. I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was rhetorical or <laughs> what. <laughs> I've heard her talk a lot about uh, like seeking quiet and not wanting noise in order in order to find her own integrity wanting to like quiet down the noise of the world right um so debbie you wanted to read your statement i printed it here for you okay great mm -hmm. we want a new vision we want to amp it up colors of the world hear our roar we are the queens and kings of color come and see us we love our art. We've got a disability, but what of it? We're part of a puzzle that got slipped into place. Here we are, not a club. We are individuals with a passion for art. We demand that we, what we paint is real and true, no matter who creates it. We are bold in the creation. We do love our work. We were put on this earth for a purpose. We are putting our own marker on the world. I am an artist, hear my roar. So we wanted to end with some New Year's resolutions for 2020 and beyond. Debbie, you came in on Raise a Little Hell. Why don't you tell us why you picked that song? I picked that song because I'm tired of society treating people with disabilities like we're nothing. We've got a voice. We need to be heard. So I'm asking and telling people to let us in. If not, we're kicking the door down. <laughs> so let's give people some tools. So resolution number one, become aware of ableism. And you can surely take out your phone and photograph these for later reference. Unlearn ableist language, embrace the social model of disability to create a community of access. So this is a really good place to start. There, uh, there are a lot of words that we use uh, just flippantly in everyday speech that are very harmful, and we're not going to speak them into this space, but go home and Google it. Um, you don't realize how uncool and unkind you sound when you use them. 
So uh, learn about ableism. Ableism centers non-disabled perspectives, and uh, we get a lot of hurtful language. Yeah, to each other. we do. Like people call us stupid or retarded or dumb. We're not taking it anymore. And then, uh, you know, embracing the social model, of disability, social model of disability, so recognizing that people are not disabled by their impairments, they're disabled by the physical barriers in the space and by the social structures that, that don't support them adequately. So resolution number two, share your access. Share your access to power and resources, make space. This is a big one, and it's really about, like, first recognizing the power that you have. And if you're a white cisgender person in the room, you have a lot of power that has just been handed to you from a history of colonization and slavery. So you have to really acknowledge that and, 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 and be comfortable with being just uncomfortable about that and, uh, and find, uh, you know, list those ways out. How do you have access to power? What are the spaces that you're moving into after this talk? Uh, you know, are you working in policy? Are you in a part of a, a creative corporation? How can you share access to uh, financial resources, a place to sleep? Um, I don't know, how can you share your access outwards? It's a tricky one, but spend time uh, really meditating on this. Resolution number three, curate against your bias. So what are you letting speak into your life? Seek out and follow disability artists and projects. I am an artist with a disability. I have Williams syndrome. And I don't let it bother me. And we live in a time where more than now more than ever the visual culture that you consume is curated by you. And your Instagram feed and your Netflix. If you look at your Netflix feed tonight and it's all white princess stories, you gotta ask yourself, what are the choices you're making in life, right? Exactly. So this is a get your phone out moment. Literally get your phone out. We need you to follow us on Instagram. Please, <laughs> please follow us. We love it. It's not only about, yeah, it's also like a, a gesture of support and, 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 and politicizing your Instagram feed, but like, you know, when you put your eyeballs on an organization's Instagram feed, for example, uh, that makes us more appealing to sponsors. It increases our visibility and it also speaks, um, uh, you know, difference and, and uh, like broadens your perspectives through what you consume. Um, so anyway, thumbs up, Instagram, Hit the little icon. You're going to search Being Studio or Being Studio underscore Ot, I think, is the official handle. I should have had it on the screen. I apologize. <laughs> so we're at like 841 right now. I want to see it get up there to like, I think we could get to Yeah, 1,000. Like Come on, people. Join us. <laughs> I also want to encourage you to follow Tangled Art Plus Disability. They are a disability uh, led arts organization based in Toronto, and through them you'll be introduced to all kinds of amazing artists and thinkers and projects. So being studio of Tangled Artless Disability will give you a moment. Thank you, Tangled Art, yes. It should have like a pink squiggly one. I really apologize for not having the social media. Their logo is like that. Tangled underscore arts. Yes. Okay. Great. And we'll end uh, with a quote. Did you want to read that? I am looking for an art world in the real world. By Annalisa Keskis. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>